Okay, this sermon is entitled, Scriptural Mutilation. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 87 reads, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. Now when it comes to false prophets, and I'm referring to unsaved false prophets, these people cannot or refuse to teach the scripture with any veracity. And one of the reasons why is because they don't have any biblical understanding of scripture. And one of their biggest methodologies when it comes to deceiving people is to twist scripture out of context, to pervert what it says, and to leave out parts of scripture. Basically, they're just mutilating the word of God in order to teach their false doctrine. And when it comes to people who are reading the Bible neutrally, with no ulterior motive, they typically don't botch or take amiss what the Bible is teaching. And this is something that only false prophets with a satanic agenda do. And this is something they have to do. Because you don't get to a false gospel by just reading the Bible at face value, believing it, and then teaching it correctly. So I'd like to go into some verses that these false prophets use and explain how they mutilate it. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It reads in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. Now what these false prophets do is, they put the emphasis on the words, such were some of you, meaning that you're no longer guilty of the sins on this list. And once you're saved, you can't commit those sins any longer, but that's not what this is teaching at all. The Apostle Paul is just simply saying that now that you're saved, you're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified, you're no longer considered a fornicator, an adulterer, effeminate, a drunkard, a thief, etc. And this has nothing to do with whether people commit these sins after they're saved or not. The whole point is to show the believer in Christ their new position, and that is that they're washed, they're sanctified, and they're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. But see, when it comes to false prophets, they teach a works-based salvation, so they have to make believe that if you're truly saved, you're not committing these sins any longer, but that proves that they're not saved because they're not trusting in Jesus Christ to pay for sins. They're trusting in themselves to not commit the sins. Now, the next verse they mutilate is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, this is a classic example of just leaving off context-unveiling verses. And what they do is they read verse 12, but they completely ignore verse 13. It reads, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, when it comes to the modern perversions, that uses the word disown. But they still try to make this teach that if you deny God, he will deny you meaning that you lose your salvation. But if you just continue reading, in verse 13, it proves this garbage wrong. It says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So even if a person stops believing, God remains faithful. And the reason why he cannot deny himself is because his faithfulness never fails. And that's why our salvation is completely secure. So watch out for the unsaved false prophets who just want to isolate one verse, totally mishandle it, and then teach a false way of salvation. Now, the next verse they mutilate is found in Luke chapter 6. Let's go ahead and turn there. This is used to prop up lordship damnation. It reads in verse 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now, they claim that this verse is teaching that, why are you calling God Lord, but you're not obeying him? And the reason why this destroys lordship damnation is because 
they are the ones calling him Lord, Lord. Now, in free grace theology, we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, but we don't have to make him Lord to be saved. So this verse actually just proves that these lordshippers are nothing but a bunch of stupid hypocrites because they call God Lord, but they do not do the things that he says. For instance, they don't preach the correct gospel, and they don't do any type of legitimate soul winning whatsoever. Those are just two examples of them not doing what the Bible tells them to do. The next place where these unsaved false prophets mutilate the scripture is found in Matthew chapter 7. This is probably the most common place in the entire canon of scripture that gets mutilated by these unsaved devils. It reads in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now the first thing these people do is they claim that the will of the Father is works, ongoing works that you have to keep doing, which is a bunch of garbage. The will of the Father is to believe on Jesus Christ, as it says in John 6.40. And then they also claim that the reason why Jesus is casting these people away is because they're workers of iniquity. But in reality, the reason why these people are being cast into hell at the great white throne judgment is because they were trusting in themselves. They were bragging, boasting, and taking credit for their so-called salvation by claiming, Have we not prophesied in thy name, and cast out devils in thy name, and done many wonderful works? The reason why he says, Ye that work iniquity, is because anyone who's not saved is a worker of iniquity, because they're still in their sins, and they don't have a savior. So these verses do not teach work salvation. They completely refute it, and they prove that work salvationists are the ones going to hell. So the next place that these unsaved devils mutilate the scripture is in Acts chapter 2. This is known as Peter's sermon at Pentecost, and that's why the Pentecostals commonly go to these verses to teach a works-based salvation. It reads in verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, in verse 37, the question is asked, What shall we do? And this is not a salvific question. It's not the same as Acts 16, 30, and 31, where the question is asked, What must I do to be saved? And then the answer is given, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. These people were already saved. In verse 21, it describes the people as being saved. They called upon the name of the Lord. And they're simply asking, What shall I do now? And after a person gets saved, they should be baptized because of the remission of sins, not in order to achieve the remission of sins. The remission of sins comes from when Jesus Christ shed his blood at the cross. So Peter would not be telling an unsaved person that you need to get baptized before you're saved. In Acts chapter 8, the scripture is clear that the person needs to believe and then be baptized. So this verse does not teach baptismal regeneration and repenting of sins and all this works-based salvation garbage like these unsaved charismaniac Pentecostals teach. It's simply saying that now that you're saved, then you can get baptized and receive a gift by the Holy Ghost. So the next place that these unsaved devils mutilate the scripture is in James chapter 2. Now the Catholics are the most culpable of distorting and perverting these verses. Let's take a look at verse 24 and it reads, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Now, the stupid Catholics totally ignore the word how. It doesn't say, ye see then that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. It says, ye see then how that by works a man is justified, not by faith only. So the how denotes that there's a different type of justification. There's justification before God, and there's justification before man. Now, if you back up a few verses, we understand the context here. In verse 23, this is talking about Abraham, when he was 75 years old, being justified forensically, positionally, 
by faith in what the scripture says, it reads in verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, if you jump back to verse 21, this is 25 years later. This is not the same type of justification. It reads, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, this would be justification before man. And if you confuse or conflate the two justifications, you have a works-based salvation. All you have to do is just go back to Romans chapters 3, 4, and 5, and you will find that we are justified by faith without the deeds of the law, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then in chapter 5 and verse 1 it reads, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the scripture does not teach justification by faith alone with a contradiction in James. It's just the unsaved Catholics and the works trusting devils out there, they just don't know how to interpret James, and that's their problem. So now, the final verse I want to look at is in Matthew chapter 24. Now, this verse is mutilated to the point of stupidity. I don't see how anyone can take this interpretation seriously. In Matthew chapter 24, it reads in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. They say, well, there you go. You have to endure to the end to be saved. Now, what this discloses is that the people who think this and who teach this are not already saved. Logically, a person is not doing something to be saved if they're already saved. Just like you're not trying to get somewhere if you're already there. You can't be inside of Burger King and then say, well, how am I going to get to Burger King? It doesn't make any sense. You're already there. And this is not talking about eternal salvation. This is talking about the tribulation Jump ahead to verse 22, and it reads, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So this is talking about a physical salvation for those who endure the tribulation. It's not talking about getting eternal life. The saved already have eternal life. John 3.15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So... The only reason anyone thinks that you have to endure to the end to be saved is because they're not already saved. And they're not going to be saved by enduring to the end either. Because this is not even talking about eternal salvation. It's talking about physical salvation. And we're not even in the tribulation yet. So this has nothing to do with anything currently. So watch out for these misinterpretations of scripture, these scriptural mutilations, and... Just understand that when it comes to salvation, the Bible is crystal clear and there's no confusion and you only have confusion when you're dealing with a false prophet who wants to pervert the gospel and teach all sorts of man-made nonsense that's going to send his soul to hell. So that's all I have. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.